This is Heron Addiction, where we cover romance and drama manhwa, and where we do our best to not ruin everyone's life that we come in contact with. I'm Isekai Sensei Sama, aka Brad, and as always, I'm joined by Bento Baggins, aka Ben. With my glowing blue eyes and my curly blonde locks. Be sure to find us on social media, which you can find links for on our website, animepodcastreincarnation.com. So today, uh, in honor of Ben's Horror Bullshit Month, <laughs> we are covering the Poe Clan, a 1972 classic. Poe no Ichizoku. <laughs> it says shoujo. I, I guess I guess that's fair to say. It, it doesn't <laughs> really cross any lines, at least as much as as, as I read. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit. So to do something a little bit different for this episode, uh, Ben's going to give us the back cover summary instead of whatever the heck I found. So take it away. The Poe clan, a race of vampirellas who feed on the energy of the living, whiling away the centuries in a village of roses where time and geography have no meaning. A brother and sister, Edgar and Maribel, are initiated into the clan too young, and, unless a wooden stake or a silver bullet should lead to their demise, are doomed to live for all eternity. Through these immortal adolescents and the mortals whose lives they touch, Moto Hagio explores what it means to live and to die and to have loved and lost. Created by a pioneer of the shoujo slash shonen ai genres, and therefore one of the world's most Influential cartoonists, this groundbreaking young adult series was originally released in the 1970s. And in my version, uh, Fantagraphics proudly presents the first two volumes of this best selling manga in English for the first time. So I read the official translation. I don't know if you think that's an accurate summary. I think that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> As always with summaries, they don't really give you the entire picture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, okay. So shoujo, uh, what do you what are you thinking? Are you thinking it's like Jose, or are you thinking it's it's too I, much? I think it's probably fine to call it shoujo. Um, I think it's definitely on the on the upper limits of shoujo. It's it's skirting the line of Jose. It uh, yeah, I think it's. Um, I would honestly say when I started reading this, I, uh, after a couple of chapters, I immediately had to Google, uh, when was interview with a vampire written? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, and this came first, this, the whole original run of this was finished before interview with a vampire came out. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff in here where I'm going, huh, that's what this thing did. Oh wait, that's what this other thing did. And it's just like, is this the the originator of like all this vampire media stuff? Moto Hagio is on, and I'm gonna say it, and I don't care. The bleeding edge of queer vampire drama, though vampire drama. I mean, vampires have always been dramatic and and queer ever since like Dracula. But yeah. Uh, it, it, I, I, <laughs> I don't know to, 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 to say queer, I, I, I understand where you're coming from. I think it's, it's a little too normy to be normie? called queer. There's, there's not really a whole lot besides the fact that they're extravagantly beautiful. Oh no, um, they kiss. Hmm? Edgar and Alan kiss. I guess I didn't get to that. They, part. No, they are very very much lovers. Okay, then. <laughs> <It is laughs> what chapter is that in? Um, there is a lot of boy love in, uh, oh gosh, there's the a second whole, volume. There's a whole arc. I think it's, it starts with chapter five. Uh, Edgar and Alan go to a, uh, boys school in Germany in the fifties. And there is several relationships between, uh, boys in this. And then, um, it's kind of, 
I would say it, it's made explicit. Like there are kisses, uh, there are definitely embraces, um, more than just Edgar and Allen, by the way, there's, there's a lot of, uh, male intimate relationships in this boarding school in Germany. That, that was especially the case. And then as you get into volume two, which goes, um, goes for some of the, some more adventures with Edgar and Alan, like you get a chapter where you actually see how Alan, um, Alan turning into a vampire. That's, that's pretty intimate. I have to say then, um, we, we definitely want to recommend the official, uh, translation, the official volumes, um, you know, as always support the official release. Um, but more specifically the version of this that I read, the chapters do not line up, um, and everything isn't available. So I didn't read that chapter. That chapter was not in what I read and, None of what I read uh, got into that stuff. So, uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about why I wanted to do this. Um, so I had heard about this for a long time. Um, it's it's referenced in a lot of shojo comics. A lot of shojo artists listed as an inspiration. Um, and not just shoujo. This was a pretty influential manga in its time. And it's still running today. Uh, Moto Hagio, I think she wanted to stop writing manga, but then she had, um, she had some kind of health scare. And I think it made her realize she, she should do the thing she wants to do and she should she wasn't too old to write manga. Like if she didn't do it now though, she might be. So I think she started uh, putting stuff out again. Um, so I haven't read any of the new stuff. I only read the original run, which was from 72 to 76. Um, and I'd been hearing about it, like I said, for, for years and years, but you can't find it in English anywhere. Um, it was just too old, too weird. Um, I don't know. Nobody picked it up for a long time. But then this uh, Fantagraphics Publishing, which I've never heard of before, uh, picked it up and did two awesome hardcover sets of the original run. And I did pick that up. It is uh, going to set you back a bit. It's 80 bucks <laughs> for both. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's a downside of this. It's not like the world's most accessible thing. And I don't think this is on any apps or anything that you can you can get for any cheaper, but the official translation is, uh, so good. It is one of the best translations I've ever read. I actually looked up the person who translated it, which I hardly (laughs) ever do. Her name is Rachel Thorne. Uh, she's from Pennsylvania, but she works as an, assistant professor or an associate professor at Kyoto Seika university as a cultural anthropologist. And in addition to that, she translates shoujo manga and the translation, the translation of this is it's so much more than just taking it and telling you what the Japanese said. And I think that, might also contribute to our different perspectives maybe Probably, yeah um because the translation elevates this quite a lot it makes it significantly more dramatic i didn't uh have any trouble seeing the drama it well the drama <laughs> is it's thick it, <laughs> so this the, reminded me so much of like those old british the british tv like I, you could almost call them soap operas, but you know, British dramas Yeah, where it's, it's tons of like, it's these, these wide angle shots and women sprawled out on couches going, Oh my goodness. Oh, Oh. Uh, and it's like, you know, their period pieces and everything. And I'm just reading this, 
hearing those voices, those British voices, uh, through the lens of like a CRT, uh, you know, old, uh, console television sitting in a living room, in a, a wood paneled living room, just like, oh, I could just picture it on, on TV. This reads like, uh, literally a Jane Austen novel. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's. There's points where I know she went above and beyond because like the Bible quotes Edgar and and people around him dramatically quote the Bible all <laughs> the time. And uh, she goes out and I'm, sh- I'm pretty certain she's not taking, she's not taking a Japanese translation of an English text and then translating it back to English from the Japanese. She's going out and she's finding the quote in the King James Bible yeah, and she's putting it in the way it should have been. And then there's all these times where like Edgar is singing these haunting Victorian lullabies and she made poetry for it. Like she took the meaning of the Japanese and it rhymes in English and it has rhythm and and meter. Hmm. And she actually created poems for all these things. Cause I went and I looked to see if these are real poems and some of them are inspired by stuff and some of them aren't like, I think there's original poetry in this. Wouldn't surprise me. Um, I was so impressed with this translator. Like I, I might have a new favorite translator, <laughs> uh, because without it, this could be very, I mean, it is cheesy, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, that's, uh, uh, that's putting it lightly. Oh, it's so it's look, It's everything you want a vampire story to be. Vampire stories are always, always so overdramatic and everything is a metaphor and everybody's sad and longing. Okay, but here's the thing. (laughs) Edward has Edgar. Edgar, Edgar. not Edward. But lots uh, (laughs) lots of references here for twilight <laughs> oh yeah oh um, yeah edgar has plenty of reasons to be depressed i got to say so the what i read was one initial big long story that was sort of like a self-contained thing but it was basically edward and his family edgar. which we find out in later chapters Mary Bell, his sister, is his real biological sister, but his parents are not his original parents. They are vampires that picked him up, basically. Yeah. Um, they aren't the ones who picked him up, or they're the ones who took him <laughs> in. It's complicated. But the point is, this first story, it's, it's uh, how many pages was it? I'm wondering what order you got your chapters in. 122 pages. Do you know what the chapter's title is? Chapter. Um, No, because they didn't translate any of the (laughs) any of the titles. Yeah. So the the thing I, I we should say off the bat, so you understand the struggle we're having with reading different versions of this. Each chapter of the Poe Clan is a self contained short story. Featuring recurring characters. Yeah. And it's all, it's usually Edgar. Um, it's usually based around Edgar. He's pretty much the main character, the protagonist, but, um, often he's not the, the leading cause of the drama. He's kind of there to exist and be enigmatic and powerful and tragic a lot of the time and stuff happens around him. Oh yeah. Everything happens around him. (laughs) This this is so I'm glad I, what I read was good as far as self-contained because there's this first story, this 120 page, basically a one shot that is sort of like, this is just a tragedy, right? So Edward, Edgar, (laughs) I'm going to keep doing that. Edgar and his family, they have to move from place to place because, you know, if they stay somewhere too long, people start. Oh to no. Did you get not... the one where everybody dies? Oh yeah. That's the first one. That's not the first one. <laughs> <laughs> no, but here, here th- this is Jesus the thing. Jesus Christ. That's fine. It's fine though. So 
they they end up in this in this town and they're there for a while and it seems like everything's great um and the the mom and the dad they've got some stuff going on they're gonna like get some people to eat right and one of them is this doctor who and the mom is like seducing this doctor right Mm -hmm. and so there's just a whole bunch of back and forth and you don't know a hundred percent that they're vampires right away um of course you did because you know (laughs) you read other chapters first but that's part of the reason why i think this this order works okay um so you get some like wait is she gonna cheat on the dad what's going on here and then it you you get this information over time obviously you probably know going into it that they're vampires because of this the blo- the blurb and everything but whatever um and so there's all this drama around this what they're trying to do here and then like this story ends because the doctor has these suspicions and his suspicions get confirmed when he takes the mom into like a shed or something and embraces her. And he's like, Oh my God, she doesn't have a pulse. It's true. They are vampires. And he fucking stabs her with a goddamn pitchfork. Like, dude, you do, you may want to confirm a little bit more before you get there. He is so lucky that he was right. Cause he was just going to murder that lady. So she, disappears into a cloud of ashes right and he, and then he runs out he's like they're all vampires and everybody grabs their torches and everything and the dad hears what's going on and he's like we got to get out of here and so he's like getting the carriage ready and i wasn't entirely clear how this happened but he like got run over by the carriage and got dusted yeah the whenever there's violence um it it's very abstract. Yeah. The, the art turns like there's a lot of ink and a lot of like flashing images and then it's over. Right. Um, and then the doctor goes and just shoots Mary bell. He just shoots her. I think with like a silver bullet, with a silver or something. bullet. Yeah. And the, the, I'm just the whole time. I'm just like, dude, dude, you're just murdering people. What if you were wrong? <laughs> what the heck are you doing? Um, <laughs> So, and Edgar escapes. Um, During this whole time, while the parents are going back and forth and all this stuff's getting set up, Edgar meets Alan. Alan Twilight. Like, come on. (laughs) Well, they already used (laughs) Poe. It's it's Edgar and Alan of the Poe clan. And Alan's original name was T- Alan Twilight. Like, it's, there's, a, there's a few things that definitely sounded better in Japanese. <laughs> because you didn't know. Uh, you didn't know. Like Twilight doesn't sound like a dumb word in Japanese. It sounds right. exotic. And <laughs> So anyway. Um, Ed- Ed- Edgar meets Alan and. He's like, oh, this boy, he's like my age. And he becomes somewhat infatuated with him. And he's like, if only I could have a friend. I just have Mary Bell. And he loves Mary Bell. They're biological. They've been together, you know, their whole lives, including the, what, hundred some odd years they've been a vampire at this point. Um, and, but he's going back and forth with Alan and Alan's a bit of a jerk, <laughs> um, but Edgar's still attracted to him. And once his whole family gets murdered, he's like, well, screw it. And he goes and he grabs Alan and like leaves with him. Now I'm obviously not doing it justice. It's very dramatic and it's very soap opera and everything. And you know, if you're into that kind of thing, you'll, you'll love this. However, after this chapter, uh, the rest of the chapters that they say are part of volume one, but as we're seeing, that's probably not true. But each of the subsequent chapters is sort of a, a little vignette of like yeah. a thing that happened. One of them takes place after this where, or no, it was like two, maybe two of them where it's just Edgar and Allen, but then some of them are take place before this. Um, 
I liked the fact that I had this one big long chapter that sort of introduced everything because it gave you enough to understand what was going on, but it was also you I, know, this tragedy and everything. I'm sure the scanlators are translating volume one of some collection. Yeah. Um, the, the volumes I have, and I think what I would recommend are these, uh, fantagraphic collections and they publish it in publishing order, like the order it came out in the magazine. Okay. Uh, and they even have dates at the end of each chapter of, uh, when it came out and in which publication. So what's the first chapter in, in that so one? The first chapter is Limpid Locks of Silver. It's a simple, this is like 19 pages. Um, it starts with um, a boy who's being uh, tutored. There's a little bit of a, like a, a spat going on, like his tutor is dating his sister. And there's some drama there. Okay, and so this is chapter four. Okay. For the scanlation. So in this, this is the first uh, chapter she ever wrote. And it's kind of just a sketch of the idea of what she's going for with the Poe clan. So mm. this boy falls for, uh, he, he falls for the girl who just moved in next door and it's Mary Bell and Mary Bell. Uh, he hangs out with her for a little bit, but then, uh, they run into Mary Bell's very overprotective older brother, Edgar. And Edgar is, he looks very unassuming. He looks like a, like a, doll he's very adorable but he acts like really imposing <laughs> and he doesn't take a lot of shit and he acts like he's better than everybody else and there's just this swagger about him that is intense and uh they go back and forth a bit there's a song uh this is one of the like poems that i think uh comes out um Mary Bell sings a song that's uh, the motif of the chapter. It's, there was a lass in days of yore, limpid locks of silver she wore, so graceful she, such rare beauty, that God told time, touch her no more. And that repeats throughout the chapter. And it's kind of in reference to Mary Bell that, uh, you know, obviously you're going to find out that he, he thinks about how like, oh, Maribel's so beautiful. I wish uh, I can understand the person who wished somebody be frozen in time like that. But then the, the Poe family moves away or the Portsnell family, the Portnell family moves away uh, and he never sees her again. And then it cuts. Oh, to, doesn't he? Well, ages pass. Uh, he's been he's an older man now. He's been married for 20 years and he's it's his anniversary. I think he's going to buy his wife flowers on the way home. And he sees this girl who looks exactly like Mary Bell. And he walks up to her and he says, Oh my God, you must be her daughter. Uh, I, I swear I knew your mother. Her name was Mary Bell. And she's like, Oh, well, my name's Mary Bell. <laughs> and he's like, Oh, she must've, she must've named you after herself. Um, and he says like, I knew your mother. She sang this song and then Mary Bell, he started, he sings the two verses or he sings the first two lines and then Maribel's like, yeah. And then she finishes it and he's like, Oh, she, uh, Maribel said something like, Oh, well maybe I look like my mother, but I never knew my birth mother. And, uh, he, he says, Oh, your mother used to sing the song, tells her the first two lines and then she finishes it. And he's like, well, how did you learn those if you never met her? And she's like, uh, she thinks about it for a second and then somebody says, come along, Mary Bell. And she looks back and she's like, Oh, my brother's calling me. And it's the same brother. It's the same kid. And that's when that guy remembers the song again and really thinks about the implications of it. That there is a girl who time has stopped for. And, uh, then it kind of ends with him wondering what, what the hell that was that he <laughs> just saw. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I think that this story, that that chapter is like the the least 
dramatic and tragic because it's basically there's no tragedy at all. Yeah. Um, it, it seems like every other chapter, something horrible happens. So the next chapter for in publication order is the village of Poe. Okay, so that's um, this is where somebody shoots Maribel. Right. Okay. So that's chapter one here. Uh, no, but she lives in this one. Uh, maybe you didn't get this chapter. Hmm. So I'll, I'll, I'll describe it a little. You tell me if it sounds familiar. So there's this guy. He's uh, hunting and it's very foggy. Oh, yeah. Is that? Um, yeah, ch- that's chapter two. Yeah. Okay. And and he, he's I think he's trying to hunt a fox and he hears rustling in the bushes. He turns around. Something pops out. He takes the shot. Unfortunately, it was a child. You're really not supposed to shoot your gun at something you haven't actually seen. Uh, that's just bad hunting etiquette. They didn't uh, have proper firearm safety training back in the 1850s. And then, uh, of course, Edgar hears the shot, comes out, takes the guy's rifle, rips it out of his hands, and smacks him across the face with it. And this guy winds up... Uh, being taken back to the village of Poe where the clan of Poe resides. And, uh, he's told to wait there while, uh, they see to Maribel. And he notices that the only crop this village grows is roses. You know, it's funny. Um, the, there's, there's lots of references to roses throughout these chapters. But then when we get to the second volume, so this chapter uh, in the second volume, they keep calling them garlic flowers. Hmm. And I'm, I'm like, I wonder what the heck the translation is here where like the literal translation is garlic flowers, but roses is what it actually is supposed to be. <laughs> yeah. Well, there, there's a lot of different flowers that come up of, because she enjoys drawing flowers. Um, but there's camellias, there's Daphne, there's uh, roses. People do grow garlic around the hedges. Like, because uh, there definitely is the folk belief of like standard vampires where um, they're supposed to fear garlic and the cross and uh, silver and a stake through the heart and the sun and all that stuff. Like, people believe those things about them, even if they're not all true. Uh, because these are not, I mean, I, I, you said it was translated as vampires for you, but the word she uses is vampirnella. She, she made up her own kind of creature that is almost a vampire, except it's cute. <laughs> uh, like it, it can feed on, I think they can feed on rose essence to an extent. I wasn't entirely sure about that. Cause they, I'm not entirely they, sure about that. They, and I've read it all. <laughs> they talk about how the vampires really only need like a drop of blood every once in a while, like months and months. They only need like a single drop of blood to be fine. And yet sometimes they go nuts and just rip somebody apart. <laughs> I think the, the, the mechanics of the vampirella are such that they are essentially vampires. They're, they are the walking dead. Uh, they need human energy and they talk about blood energy a couple of times and they can take your energy by sucking your blood, but they can also draw your blood out without being seen through their fingers like the fingertips or, or, or the mouth, if somebody needs to kiss somebody dramatically <laughs> can, can be taken. And, oh, there's a really spooky scene in, in one of the, the later chapters from like 1975 where Edgar and Alan, um, Edgar, uh, the rose essence, I don't know if it sustains them completely, but it might put off the hunger I think because there's a scene where Edgar and Alan are in a greenhouse and Ed Edgar asks Alan if he wants to take the roses and Alan says, no, 
you take them and I'll take the energy from you. And that was the other thing because <laughs> there's a whole bunch of points where they're like, the, another vampire gives them some blood. Yes. And it's can, like, well, wait a minute. How does can, that work? <laughs> they can transfer their, like vampires can feed on other vampires in this. I think specifically for the romance aspect of it. <laughs> or or not even maybe romance, but the intimacy aspect of it. Yeah. Because Edgar They're, is constantly giving Maribel blood and he doesn't have romantic feelings for Maribel. It's not that kind right. of manga. And there's a whole there's a whole plot with this in the first chapter I read, the long one, where Maribel is like sickly because mm-hmm. for whatever reason, I guess she didn't get thick enough blood. <laughs> to turn her into a vampire, whatever they say. Um, and so she doesn't get as much energy from things as the rest of them do or something like that. They they need more energy when they have to heal. And I think the problem with Mary Bell was, I don't know. Did you ever get to the chapter where Edgar gets turned? Yes. Okay. So, so Edgar gets like that good vampire blood because yeah, he's the coolest He's he, the he gets guy. his directly from Poe. Yeah, he gets the original vampire blood. And somebody in a later chapter says that was a bad because Edgar's the one that turns Maribel eventually. That's that's a whole big dramatic story. Hmm. Um they say that Edgar's blood was a bad fit for Maribel. That uh it might actually be a little too much for Maribel to handle because she was also a sickly child to an extent. Hmm. And the lore is, is a weak point, I think, but (laughs) it, it works out because like in this scene, so, so Alan's like, no, I'll get the energy from you after, after you eat the rose petals. And then somebody catches them doing this little energy transfer. And the, the, the panels are perfect. They both just turn, they're in an embrace, Edgar and Alan. And they both just turn sideways and they look at the kid and Alan looks up at Edgar and goes, you eat it and I'll get it from you. (laughs) And then they start chasing the kid. And I love that. That's classic interview with a vampire type stuff. But there's so many good little moments like that throughout that the writing is so like smart. There's, there's a scene in, uh, a particular part where Maribel's still human. I think Edgar makes a deal with the Poe clan. So Edgar and Maribel, you find out they're orphaned eventually. Um, and they were raised by the Poe clan and the Poe po clan has a rule, not unlike the rule in interview with the vampire where we don't turn kids into vampires because it's very apparent that a child doesn't age. Yeah. Um, and that's a thing like Edgar and Maribel are obviously, they were turned at like 14 and 13 respectively. So it's tough for them to exist in any town for longer than a couple of years because people immediately start wondering like, wow, that kid really hasn't grown. So Edgar used to make these water wheels for Maribel and Edgar makes a deal with the Poe clan that he'll turn, but they have to leave Maribel alone. And in order to make sure they keep their promise, Edgar says, you need to send her away. I don't trust her while she's here. Send her to live with humans and I'll agree to your terms. And, um, one of the things that their childhood memories they have is, is him making these water wheels, which are a toy that just spins in the water. And Maribel is sent to live with these humans. She hasn't seen Edgar in like 10 years in the intervening time. Edgar's been turned into a vampire and he's so tragic and lonely and he must watch her for afar because who could love this? And, um, he doesn't want to ruin Maribel's human life. So, and, and this, this was about the time I, I read this chapter. I think this was the last chapter I read and I'm glad that I did because it's sort of like, I mean, it's the origin story of them, right? Yeah. And it just really solidified for me that everything that Edgar is involved with just turns to shit. (laughs) Because 
<clears throat> Mary Bell's off living on her own. She's she's adopted by I think it was a count's family or something mm-hmm. like that. She's doing fine. Um, everybody loves her because she's so beautiful and blah blah blah. And you know, Edgar is just around. Nobody knows he's there. He's just hanging around watching her from the shadows. And what we find is that the this uh, this other count's son falls in love with her, and he's like a playboy, and he's like, "But she's the most beautiful. I'm gonna I'm gonna devote everything to her." And he starts, you know, doing this courtship stuff, and his mother is like, "No." No, you can't. No, not oh, her. Oh, yeah. As soon as she gets a look at Maribel, she's like, not that one. No. And so we're like, oh, what's what's <clears> weird <throat> going on here? Um, in addition, his brother uh, also falls in love with Maribel. And his brother is like this little, you know, fairy child <laughs> kind of guy. Right? Oh, yeah. He's so weird. He's got long, long hair and his eyes are always black. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> strange. Um, so you have these two brothers. They're both in love with with her. But the one brother is like, why is this? Why is mom being so weird about this? She's like, no, absolutely not. Before um, you go there, I just want to say the one thing that got that made me know that this was all going to go bad was when he that brother he she tells him all about her 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 long lost edgar and how much she misses him and how he used to make these water wheels and this kid tries to make a water wheel for her and fails and he's like i'm sorry i didn't get it to work but then she she walks down to the river and there's a water wheel in there and she's <laughs> like oh why did you lie you could do it and he's like yeah i definitely made that that was <laughs> that was me um and i was like oh my god edgar is here and he's going to kill this guy if he touches Maribel. <laughs> <laughs> which is, which is, I think a, a good assumption to make, but turned out wrong because this guy goes to visit his dad because his mom and his dad are living in separate houses because they're, they're, they're estranged, but not really estranged. They just live separately, but they don't like each other, but they're fine with it. It's a weird aristocracy bullshit thing. Um, but he goes to visit his dad and he's like, there's this beautiful woman. There's this beautiful girl. I'm going to marry her, but mom's being weird about it. What the heck's going on? And his dad's like, look at this portrait of this woman that I loved and had children with while I was married to your mother. And it looks exactly like Mary Bell. Secret half brother. <laughs> so this this guy <laughs> finds out that Mary Bell is actually his sister. And he's like, well, shit, I can't marry her then. Oh, but my brother is in love with her and my brother has a different father. Yeah, they're not blood related. So my brother, Ken, and I, I still love this girl, even though I can't be married to her and I want her to be happy. So I'll give her to my brother. And then he goes into like this depressive episode where he throws tea on this other guy and the guy's like, we're going to have a duel. And he's like, yeah, let's have a duel because I want to die. And he goes out, they go to have a duel and his brother's like, finds out at the last minute and he rides off. He's like, I have to stop this. Mo, my brother, I love you. Even though they're like, you know, they have a contemptuous relationship. And then he realizes, he realizes that his, uh, the, the, the younger brother realizes that his mother had this woman killed at a certain point and that the mistress. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That he, she had the mistress killed and he's like, Oh, this is so weird. Like there's all this drama in our family that I never knew about. And I like, it's all complicated. And I thought like, I thought that I was like taking care of my mother, but my mother is actually this terrible person. It's at least like, I don't want him to die now. There's just so much we have to talk about. We got to resolve all this. So he shows up at the, at the dual site and it turns out that these guys fired back and forth four separate times or something like that. And the guns never went off. Yeah. I looked at that and I was like, I don't think that's how duels work. That was a, that was one of the problems. So there's a, they they take their pistols and they're like, who shoots first? So I, I think that actually, it does work like that. That's dumb. 
Well, yeah, but see, I would not agree to that duel. <laughs> what, what you have to remember is that way back then, guns were so wildly inaccurate that if you fired at each other from ten yards, the chance that you would hit the person was actually quite low. It was it was rare for people to actually die from gun duels back then. Huh. I man, I I would not have agreed to that duel. But yeah, well, so you certainly wanna, wouldn't want to do that today with modern right. guns because you'd be dead. Yeah. Um, who goes first? Well, it's okay. Who wins? <laughs> do we even have to act it out? <laughs> Can we just say he wins then? <laughs> so that, that that was a whole thing. They didn't go into like maybe Edgar screwed with the guns or something like, like there's no explanation. It's He's just, in the background watching it. And it, I was wondering if that was implied. Like, did Edgar save this guy? Would Edgar save this guy? Edgar's a complicated little man. Yeah. But what it comes down to is Edgar <laughs> found out that this was his original family, right? And through all of this, he's like, okay, I'm a monster, but they're all together. This will be fine. I'm just going to leave. They'll all be fine. But then, what's his name? Eustace? Or Eustace, Eustace, yeah. Eustace, the little brother, um, is like, I can't pick between Mary Bell and my mom because my mom's freaking out about this. And, but I love Mary Bell. And so he's going to kill himself. Oh, yeah. And Edgar's finally at peace, which he's seems fu- a little over dramatic, but okay. Edgar's and okay so, with the whole thing. And he's like, Eustace will take care of Mary Bell now. I can, right. I, I can fade and I can trust that she's going to be happy the rest of her life. So Eustace goes into his room and he gets a knife. He's going to like slit his wrists or something. He does slit his wrists. He, he wrote his suicide note. Edgar is looking in the window and sees him about to like stab himself or whatever. And he's like, no. And he breaks in and the knife flies around and kills Eustace anyway. At which point, uh, the older brother, what was his name? I forget his name. Uh, Art. I know the Oswald is the family title. Uh, I forget. But the older brother busts into the room because he hears the commotion. And he's like, sees uh, Edgar covered in blood. And at this point, he had seen Edgar once or twice. And he was like, is that Edgar? Because that's how Mary Bell exactly described him. And he's like, Edgar, you killed Eustace. And Edgar's like, ah, he flies out the window. And so now there's this whole crazy thing. Mary Bell thinks that Ed, Edgar murdered Eustace. She's like, no, my brother, he, well, he did it, but he sure, couldn't have. And they're pretty sure that Edgar's a vampirella at this point because he hasn't aged at all. Yeah. And there's other signs. And they give Mary Bell a, a silver knife. Like she's going to, to defend herself should Edgar show up for her. Right. Um, so, so she goes to bed with her silver knife, the, the, this, you know, a couple nights later or whatever. I think it was a little while later because at this point that they, they adopt her back from the other count so that they can all live happily together. And the mom's actually like, well, now my son is dead. I'm just going to take care of this girl. Because I feel like we're very similar. It, it, it was it was weird, but whatever. So they're all living together for a little while. Um, she goes to bed with this knife that the older brother gives her. And um, at the same time, the older brother stumbles upon a letter. I think it was it under his mom's pillow? Something like that. Yeah. And he looks at the letter and it's Eustace's suicide note. And so he goes to his mom and he's like, Eustace killed himself. He wasn't murdered by Edgar. And the mom's like, oh, freaking out and everything. And they, they rush to Mary Bell's room and Edward is, Edgar is spiriting her away. Yeah, because while at the same time, it's dramatically positioned because at the same time they're finding out that Edgar didn't kill Eustace, Maribel thinking Edgar killed Eustace is confronting Edgar. Yeah. And I, oh, that was actually, I skipped over that. That's the best part because he goes in and he's like, I'm, I'm going to leave forever. You're going to be happy here with them. 
And Mary Bell's all conflicted because she's like, but you murdered him, but I love you. You're my brother and I've missed you so. And they embrace and they embrace for a while. And then Edgar's like, are you going to do it or not? Implying that she should stab him with the silver knife. He's, yeah, I think in, in my translation, he says, go on, do it. Yeah. Yeah. He wants her to. And she's like, I can't do it. And so they fly out of the window together just as the, the rest of the family bursts through the door. And so everybody's sad <laughs> because Edgar was there and he <laughs> makes everybody sad. But he knows he makes everybody sad. And that's I'm such what a makes monster. It, yes, he's a monster. Yes, you are. You are literally a curse on everyone around you. <laughs> Oh man, there's so many good things. I think the one, like, I do want to talk a little bit about the, um, the birds. Uh, what's, where's this start actually? Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about the bird's nest. Uh, that's chapter six and this is, or six in publication order. This is, this is a pretty long one and this this one takes place in the fifties. This is what I was telling you about where Edgar and Alan wind up at a boys school. They wind up at a boys school in Germany. And this is where things get explicitly shown in eye, which is, uh, the actual Japanese word. That's, that's the, that's where boys love comes from. Hmm. Better translation would be boys in love, but, it's two words in Japanese, so it might as well be two words if you look it up in English. <laughs> um, but Edgar and Alan go to this uh, school, and this is the first chapter after you you know Alan's turned into a vampire. So in publication order, this would be the, the next time they see Alan, is he's standing there like 70 years later, with Edgar and they're both dressed in their little boys prep school suits and they look super cute together and um, they integrate into this boys school and they're there for some reason, but the reader doesn't know what it is and they're having an argument because Alan doesn't want to be here. He's sick of this and Edgar's like, Alan just shut up and deal with it. <laughs> and they're, it's in Germany, so they're supposed to be speaking German, but Alan keeps speaking English only to Edgar. And people keep calling him out on it. They're like, you know, that's kind of rude. Does he not speak German? He's like, no, he speaks fluent German. He's just being a brat. He really is, though. Every story <laughs> he's in, I'm just like, this kid is a brat. Okay, one of the smaller stories that was in here was they're just like hanging around in this small village or whatever, and there's these... I think they're sisters. There's just two sisters. And Edgar's like, I have to go away for a week. And Alan's all like, Man, you're going to leave me alone for a week. That's so mean. I'm going to have fun without you. And so he like sees these two sisters and the, uh, Oh, the, he meets the, the one first and like helps her with something and then just kisses her out of nowhere. I'm like, dude. <laughs> um, and she's like, and runs away as she should good for her but then um her older sister is like oh that was rude of you to do that to that boy i'm like eh, no that was rude of him um and so they go back and meet him <laughs> that is proper like victorian morals right when a man kisses you you kiss him back and so they're like she's like i'm sorry for my sister hey hey let's have a picnic you li you you live in this uh, mansion across the river. You're new here. Let's have a picnic. And so they start hanging out this week, right? And he separately meets these sisters when they're apart, even though they're all hanging out together. Like if one goes to pick some flowers or whatever, he'll kiss the other one. And then like they climb a tree, and then he and the the one that climbed a tree with him, he kissed her. And and so they're both like, oh, he loves me. And then they're like fighting each other over this. And then Edgar comes back and they just leave. Like, Alan, that is jerk. what Alan does. That is what Alan does. So he is obviously in this chapter with Edgar, but he doesn't want to be here. And when he doesn't want to be here and Edgar's on some mission, 
uh, he makes Edgar's life more difficult because Alan is sitting there like in English, you know, he's talking to Edgar and they both know they're like, we could kill everyone here if we wanted to. Why are we playing this game? Like Alan's just like, I don't want to be here. I've got stuff to do. Can we just go back to England? And he's like, play along. Okay. And they're both like a hundred years old at this point, And they're dealing with these other 14 year old boys. And Edgar is like sitting there trying to play, play it cool and trying to integrate. And Alan is like, I hate all of you. This is beneath me. I, this is so stupid. Uh, they, there's all these little moments that are just like fan service where like, um, the boys are supposed to be learning etiquette and they have to learn how to waltz and they have to pick a partner and who's going to be the lead and who's going to be the, the follow. And, uh, of course, Edgar and Alan dance, they dance beautifully. Edgar is the lead. Alan follows perfectly. He twirls him. Uh, it's, it's magnificent. And some of these boys are like, man, I, I'd kind of like to dance with Edgar. And they're like, but, I mean, that, that's the girl's part. And he's like, <laughs> well, yeah, not, not like the girl's part, but like, you know, Edgar's a really good dancer. I, I just like to, you know, be I closer just, to him. I would just like to be held by him. <laughs> but no, Alan does the exact same thing. There's, there's this boy who's kind of a loner and everything. And Alan picks on him. He catches Alan doing something that Alan shouldn't be doing. There's a guy who has a watch that he loves with a picture of his daughter in it daughter looks like Maribel. So Alan steals his watch and the guy is distraught. Like this is all he has left of his daughter. And somebody catches this, this little loner kid catches Alan with the watch and Alan's like, Oh, but you won't tell anyone, will you? And he's like, he's this kid's hobby is he's a gardener. He's always in the greenhouse by himself and he's got these roses and he's like, I'll give the watch back. I'll give the watch back when the roses bloom. And then, of course, somebody tears the roses apart. And this kid does not put together that it was Alan that <clears> tore <throat> the roses apart. And eventually, Alan and Edgar have a fight. And Alan runs up to this kid and he's like, I tore apart your roses. And the kid's like, what? And then Alan kisses him. And he's like, you don't hate me, do you? And... He's just trying to piss Edgar off. Yeah. <laughs> That's what all of this is about. I, I there's there's a point here. Uh I I was thinking about this as I was reading it, especially as I got further into it. And when I read like the origin of Edgar and Mary Bell, and they actually talked about some time frames that are involved here. Because Edgar and Mary Bell, like their whole origin starts in like the 1750s. Mm-hmm. And so by the time of Mary Bell's actual death, when she gets shot by that doctor and then the uh, Baron Portsnell and his wife also get unceremoniously murdered. Um, that's in like the 1850s, 1880. Yeah. Um, so more than a hundred years or about a hundred years after they had been turned. Now you could look at, Edgar and go, okay, you know, he looks like a kid, but a lot of the stuff that he does, he's acting like an adult. But Mary Bell stays acting like a child the whole time. And in fact, when I read the first, the long one, as I said, the one where they die, I got the impression that Mary Bell was turned when she was like three or four years <clears throat> younger than Edgar. But yeah. in this origin story, it seems that Mary Bell basically was allowed to age up to the same age as Edgar, potentially even a little bit older before she was turned. I think she's 13 when she's turned. She is. So she is by like body wise. She is one year younger. Okay. But so I'm reading this, this one where they all die and I'm just going, she acts like a dumb little girl, even when they're the only ones around She's over a hundred years old. Has she not mentally aged at all? Did you get to read the chapter where Edgar succumbs to crippling amnesia? No. Oh, that's, that's right. That is a proper soap opera episode. It is written later. It's written in 1975, but, 
But Maribel, it, it's set, it's written in 1975, but it's set before Maribel died. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and there's a couple of those in here. Edgar um, gets this amnesia. And so this is what, what I'm saying is this is one of the last Maribel chapters she wrote. Mm-hmm. And Maribel goes to get Edgar back and she has to come up with a plan to like worm her way into this family who found Edgar and's taking care of him hmm. and, and trick Edgar into remembering stuff. And then <laughs> they're, um, they're trying to help Edgar and they pray for him and somebody gives him a cross to wear around his neck. And Maribel is not strong enough to, to tank the cross. And so she has to convince another boy who's in love with her to just steal the cross for her, steal <laughs> Edgar's cross. I really want it. And so she is kind of cunning and stuff, but I think maybe that is Hagio's writing evolving over time and she's retroactively giving Maribel yeah. a little more of a personality. But the I, I noticed it as well with Alan, where in some of the in some of the chapters after he's a vampire, after it's established he's been alive for it, you know, multiple decades at least. He's still acting like a snot nosed little brat. <laughs> I I do like the the dynamic in uh, the the boys' school is one of my favorite chapters because I love their dynamic where Alan, yeah, Alan is probably sixty or seventy years old at this point, and Ed, but Edgar is like in his two hundreds at least, yeah, and and Alan is acting like Edgar acted with Lord Portnell when Lord Portnell yeah. turned him and Edgar and when Edgar is probably in his like thirties or forties, he's like, we're Vampirella. We kill people. Why are we, why are you doing this shit with the doctor? Like, why are you doing this? Uh, like, why are you, why are you guys doing this? We could just t- take what we want. And Lord Portnell's like, uh, no, we really can't. There's like, millions of these people <laughs> and like a couple dozen of us like yeah and what we saw you only need one yeah as soon as one he's like you don't know what they're like uh when they get riled up like they can take us like mm-hmm. you you need to be careful with this shit and also we don't need to kill people necessarily we can take a little bit of of, of blood we don't need to take and turn everybody and and the the rule with the turning is and I don't know when this I guess this started I'm trying to remember if this is in Dracula or not. I'm trying to remember when most people who are killed by Vampirella just die. Like if you have your blood taken, you just die. To be turned into a Vampirella, you have to have blood given. You have yeah. to you have to ingest a vampire's blood. And I'm trying to remember if Bram Stoker wrote about that. I I can't off the top of my head, but even in Stoker, the blood is very obviously a metaphor for other fluids. (laughs) It's 100% an intimate exchange of fluids. Like it is, that has been, there are people who are like, well, I, I want vampires to be scary again. And it's like, you've never read any of the source material. <laughs> they were always sexy from the very beginning. Which, you know, it makes me think, obviously, the writers have to write things in a way to make it dramatic and entertaining and everything. But like, if these vampires were the least bit intelligent, they would just like, go find someone down on their luck and be like, Hey, come live in our village. We just need a little bit of your blood every once in a while. And you can live a, a a very, you know, great life. We'll take care of you. And Hey, once you get to a certain age, we can stop your aging. They could just pick up a person to have once every 20 years. That's literally what they did with Edgar though. And he fucked it up. But did he? Yes. I think they fucked it up. Edgar. So, oh man, well, I'll get into a little of Edgar's origin story there because Edgar is pissed when he finds out these people are Vampirella. He doesn't want to be, he wants to be human. And that is like the, 
uh, the, the drama, the driving force of drama through every story is Edgar wants to be human and he can't and it pisses him off. And because it pisses him off, he makes bad decisions. Right. But also he didn't have much of a choice. No, he didn't. His, his mom got murdered. And then he just got picked up by the vampires who took and, care of him. And Whereas, that's, but he made a deal. That's yeah. the, that's the problem. So like, while he, did, it's tragedy, but they picked up Edgar and they said, we want to turn you into a vampire when you're old enough. And he said, fine, but you have to leave Maribel alone. And they said, deal. And then Edgar, when he's about 14 is playing with the village kids and he's trying to think of a way to, to welch on this deal. He's trying to think of a way to get the vampires killed and not have to deal with this anymore. And he drops a hint to a kid whose mother had been killed by a vampire and his father has gone insane and now spends his nights digging up every grave and putting a stake through the heart of the corpse. Uh, he tells this kid, um, basically that, uh, they're going to sacrifice another person. It's, it's these people. They sacrifice somebody every, every 10 years or so. And uh, that kid tells his dad and the dad goes nuts and just stabs like the first uh, Poe clan he sees. He and just that, stabs an old woman who he has no idea is actually a vampire. But this guy was unstable. So it, it's not like it didn't make sense for him to do from a story perspective. Yeah. Because he was unstable. He had been wrecked with grief for his entire, basically, life since his wife died. And yeah, he just runs up and puts a stake through her heart. But then she turns to dust. And then the person she was walking with is also a vampire. And so she just turns around and kills him. But it's too late. People have seen. People know. And they rally the village. They get their pitchforks. And Edgar's like, ha ha, yeah, all right. It's going all according to plan. And then the king vampire wakes up and he's like, okay, let's turn him. That was the deal. <laughs> <laughs> and so they turn him at 14. And now instead of being an adult vampire who has a chance of maybe living some kind of life in the human world. Now he's a 14 year old vampire who can't stay anywhere for more than two years and has to, uh, watch as everybody else grows old and, and takes lovers and has, kids and, and all this stuff. And, and he can't even engage in the half life he was supposed to have. And it's like that Greek tragedy of like, it's not your fault, but it's kind of your fault. <laughs> <laughs> but again, he was forced into it. I'm sure that they could just find someone who would be down for it and just have him hang out. But get some blood for years and years and then turn him into a vampire eventually. The thing. And then find someone else. Like, I don't think it would be that difficult. I, yeah, it wouldn't be. But then you just got a clan of groupies. And what you need is like that, that good blood. Edgar's a little asshole. That's what we need. That's the guy who, if he's a vampire, he's going to be, a, he's going to be a pretty good vampire. <laughs> What's the criteria for being a good vampire? I, dramatic. Oh, okay. <laughs> Pretty. We're not, you, we're not okay with just like living simple lives and being content. There's a chapter. So the chapter, did you get to the chapter where Alan uh, actually wakes up as a vampire for the first time? Maybe. Uh, and Edgar winds up with an orphan girl child. Yes. Literu. Oh my God. Her name's Liddy. I, I, this was <laughs> the next thing I wanted to talk about because this is unhinged. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, so Edgar and Alan are just like walking around and they like see a carriage. Right. Also, and they're Anne, like, we're rice owes this woman money. I'm sorry. But when I saw that, I was just like, that is okay. This is just fucking interview with a vampire now. And, and they're like, we're hungry. And they just attack this carriage and murder these two people. Like no, no thought about it at all. They're just, they just rip them apart. And then they like look around in this carriage and there's this little girl and they're like, oh shit, there's a little girl here. So what's happening is uh, Edgar. So Alan, 
Edgar gave Alan his blood, and Alan is not waking up. It's been two days. Maribel woke up after one day. Edgar woke up after three days, and the vampires were kind of thinking he might not, because sometimes it goes bad. Sometimes the body just can't take the blood. Mm -hmm. So Edgar has... So this takes place right after Edgar's family got blown away. Right. And Alan is all he's got left and Alan isn't waking up and he is terrified. Uh, Alan gets shot in the head at one point. There's a, there's a big fight. Um, Alan finally wakes up. He gets, he gets through it. He, He tries to attack somebody. He gets shot. He's, he's dying. He needs more blood. And, and Edgar is like going nuts right now. He's like, I cannot lose another. So Edgar does just start murdering people and taking enough, taking tons of blood to give to Alan mm-hmm. because they can do that. And then that's why he attacks this carriage because it's super dramatic and tragic why he attacks this carriage. You can't, so, you can't ignore that. <laughs> so they look in this carriage and there's this little girl. They're like, oh shit. We just murdered this little girl's parents and she's there and we don't want to kill kids. Why? I don't know. But Everybody's okay. got a line. <laughs> so, so they're like, oh, let's take care of this little girl. Let's keep her with us. And I, as I read, I, I'm like, what are you doing? Why? Why would you do this? They take this little girl and just live in the forest with her for years. She, she grows up. She's, she's like two or three when they find her. To the point where she has no idea what just happened to her parents, which is good. And then she's like seven or eight when they're finally like, you know what? We should probably like find some humans to take her. Like, no fucking shit. You should have done that for the first place. What are you doing? I mean, that's exactly the emotion the author wants you to feel, though, because you you know this is doomed. This can't work. And so they, they like, they go and drop her off with a family and, you know, she grows up just fine. But in the back of her mind, she's always like, I remember living with fairies. I grew up with fairies. This is not the only kid they do this with. Are you kidding me? (laughs) So the reason they're at the boarding school is because, um, There was a child they befriended and they pretended to be angels who came to visit him. And he's like, but you don't have wings. And he's like, trust me, even though we don't have wings, we're actually angels. And it's very creepy. (laughs) Like they're, they're grooming this kid to be a vampire. That's literally what this is. Uh, And the kid they're they're, They come to see him all the time. They, they've decided they want to turn this kid into a vampire when he's old enough. And that kid winds up, being sent to this boarding school in Germany where he experiences a lot of bullying, a lot of teasing and kills himself. Mm. And then Edgar and Alan show up and they're trying to find out who did it. And the boy Alan kissed is actually the beloved of the murderer or the, the guy who bullied the kid the most. Mm hmm. And that's why they decide we're going to turn that guy. We're going to turn the guy you like because you took what we like. Mm. And that turns into a whole big dramatic thing that everybody loses. Okay. Okay. (laughs) But that all actually makes more sense. Yeah. Than just trying to raise a child. We're just going to hang on to this girl for a couple years for fun. I think it makes them feel I, I think that's Edgar's desire to have a family because that's the weird thing is that he, yeah. he can't be a father because he's trapped in the body of a 14 year old. Just society will never see him in that role. Mm. But instinctively he, that's what he wants. Like that's the role he's ready to assume is I should be a father. Like we should be parents. Now Alan's still a little too young to be having those desires, but like that's where Edgar is. He's like, Okay, I've got Alan. He's my boyfriend. We should have a kid. And, oh, I found one. <laughs> it's perfect. It's going to work out. <laughs> I, as crazy as it was, though, it does work out because she, like, 
she has a fine life and she has her own kids and then she's got grandkids and everything and everything's fine. But which is like one of the least tragic things to happen in any of these. Well, another, another dramatic thing that's going through is like, you see these people die. Like the vampires, when humans find out vampires get killed and Edgar does wind up leaving like a little bit of a trail wherever he goes, because there's that Lord Oswald who remembers them. And that guy from the first chapter who saw Maribel, people write about their experiences with Edgar. Like yeah. he becomes like, you know, in doctor who, how there's like this cool little line of like, there's the legend of the doctor. Mm-hmm. And then when people encounter him, it's like, Oh, it's real. It's all true. There's a lot of that going on in this too, where like people who have been touched by the Poe clan keep telling their story and then more people find out and they're like, Oh my God, that's the kid. That's the, that's the creepy thing that, <laughs> You know what I was thinking about every time they draw Edgar and whenever his eyes are supposed to glow, um, there's very few color pages. Um, I don't think I got any besides covers. The colors, let me tell you, they are, they are peak shoujo. Unfortunately, this is an audio medium, so I can't show anybody else, but like, yeah, that's, uh, that looks (laughs) like one of the covers, um, that I saw. Yeah. Uh, no, it's when his eyes are supposed to be glowing blue, they're just drawn really evocatively. Mm. And um, it reminded me of that. Who is that? Uh, I can't even remember the comic we were reading, but there's a kid with silver hair and orange eyes. Orange. Yeah, he was so creepy. I said he was creepy. I think Moon <laughs> yelled at me because she really likes the kid. Um I can't remember, but like it, I don't it remember is creepy. Eyes. Like Edgar is this. Oh, like, uh, mother's contract marriage. Yes. Um, Fjord. Yes. Is it orange? Uh, yellow. Orange. orange. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're not a color eyes are supposed to be. And you, a- Edgar you're not is, caught up on that. Are you? No, <laughs> there's some stuff in the latest chapters. You should probably catch up. See if you still hate him. Oh boy. Okay. I'll, I'll see if I like him. Spoiler alert, he's still creepy. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I like Edgar, I though, and Edgar's him, though. fucking creepy. <laughs> um, no, it's... I love the art. I love this old manga style. It's a little at odds with the material now, like you know going this, back. <laughs> this art reminds me of? If you've ever seen, like, the uh, the old, like, China that is like painted with like little kids on it and stuff. Yeah. Um, it, it reminded me of that style of artwork where it's like, they're sort of cheruby kind of things, but then every once in a while there's the, the weird blobby manwa style gets mixed in when someone's mm-hmm. like really angry or whatever. And it's so out of place. <laughs> Well, there is a bit of an evolution over the years she draws it where when it starts, like the early chapters um, in terms of publication order, it's heavy Tezuka influence, Mm -hmm. Um, very disney looking characters. But then sort of as it goes on, I did notice more of a, a more modern manga style coming out in the way certain characters were drawn. Alan in particular, Edgar always has those big shoujo eyes, but Alan sometimes gets drawn with like a more modern manga aesthetic. And I don't know. I really like the art, but I really like this old art. I do think some people who pick it up are going to struggle a little bit with the, um, the seriousness of the material and the perceived goofiness of the art. <laughs> Cause I think, especially when they draw like, you know, the, the chibi effects we get in the, um, in the manhwa, uh, that is done in this as well, but it looks more like a Looney tune or like yeah. Popeye. It, it's not what we're used to seeing from this kind of thing. And that's, that can jar you right out of it sometimes. Right. Yeah. I mean, I will say like, this is 
not something that I would have read. Uh, if, yeah. <laughs> if I read a chapter of this and someone was like, are you going to keep reading this? I've been like, no, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not into this. So um, why is that? It's just, so there's multiple things. Well, as you touched on the art style, I'm just not into it. It wasn't a problem for me, but it didn't grab me in any way. And it's the kind of thing where a lot of times I just don't notice the art, but that's because it's just normal. Yeah. And so it's, it's... if something has a different art style, which I think people should try to do more often, but if it's not done it's hard to say not done right because obviously this was done on purpose, but like it's not an art style that speaks to me. So because it's different, but also I'm not into it. I'm like, okay, not into the art. Um, and it's an, it's different enough that I notice it. It's yeah. not something that I just, you know, don't think about. Um, in addition to that, the, the way that things get paced and like scene transitions and stuff like that. As I mentioned earlier, it's very much like those, you know, British dramas and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm not into that. There was one point uh, in, in the first chapter that I read that really like hammered it home. That is like, this is a British drama where there's one scene going on at the top of the page. And then, a little ways down into the page on the right side. And of course we're reading right to left on the right side is a shot of someone's face on like a black background and they're saying something. And then on the other side, on the left side of the page, it's sort of like a reverse shot of another person in the same kind of way. And they're saying something. And it was a scene transition because then the rest of the page is another scene down at the bottom. So this, this middle part, where you see this juxtaposition of two people saying different things pointed the other direction. That was like a scene transition. And I saw in my mind a scene transition in one of those British dramas where it like fades between two people as they're like saying something that's a juxtaposition or whatever. I can see that. And so I was like, oh, that's really cool that they did that. But then also if I didn't, know that already i would have had no idea what was going on yeah i think well first i think that's 100 percent what she was influenced by yeah and i think i don't know how exactly to phrase it but i (laughs) this is gonna sound this is gonna sound like a really out there comparison but this is just the the Stuff I watch. You, you watch, you're a big fan of that Some More News channel. <laughs> yeah. So he just did a thing on the Cybertruck. Mm. And he was talking about why the Cybertruck doesn't look cool, he thinks. And one of the things he said was because like in Blade Runner, that car might, that I might think the car in Blade Runner looks cool and it looks like the Cybertruck, but the reason it looks cool in Blade Runner is because the whole world matches its aesthetic. Mm. And in the time that the Poe clan was written manga all looked like this. Yeah. And that's what people would expect. And there is an element of like knowing how to read it intuitively that isn't there anymore. Like I think we've gone. So now we're reading it on cell phones and they're doing scrolling effects. And so I, I do think it is a little hard to go back. And I, I think this might get into rubric territory, but <laughs> there's there's a level of expectation setting, I think, that needs to be done here, where it's like, when I tell you this is, of all the Ben's horror bullshit stuff I have read this year, hands down my favorite. This is the <laughs> best discovery I've done this year. Um, and, and it might even be my favorite manga I've picked up this year. You need to understand that, like, It might not be your favorite manga (laughs) because um, I like the old stuff. I've read a lot of the old stuff. It's not going to surprise me. Even the storytelling, even the way it's told, it's written like an old Victorian novel. It's not paced like a manga. 
Mm -hmm. It's, it's, I, and I think if you're somebody who likes old, it's a tough recommendation because it's like, if you're somebody who recommends like, oh, you'd like this because you like old Victorian novels, you're going to wonder like, okay, well, why the hell does everybody look like an old timey cartoon character? <laughs> Shouldn't it be taking itself a little more seriously? And it's like, no, it's taking itself deadly seriously. That's what serious used to look like in Japan in 1970. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> um, I will, I will say like, I am, I'm glad that I read this because there's, there's a level of history here that is, it's just good to have knowledge of. Um, I would have probably liked a more curated experience. There were a bunch of chapters here where I was just like, this was completely unnecessary. I feel like I probably only needed four or five of these chapters to have the complete picture. I, yeah, I think that's probably fair. And there, for someone who's really into this, you, you do want all those chapters. It's an exploration of the very long life that, that Edgar has lived. And you want to be in that, explore that. But from a historical tourist perspective, which is where I'm coming from, I don't need all that. I just need the important bits. Yeah, I, I think that's actually fair. That's a good point because there's a lot of like even Edgar Allan Poe, you know, you can I've read everything he's ever written and there's a reason they have best of collections. <laughs> and it's the same with Sherlock Holmes or any other like I think that's that's another thing, too, that I don't know if a lot of people understand because they don't read two or three manga magazines, they have an app where they a la carte pick the series they want to read. Mm -hmm. and it's like, well, some of these, yeah, some of these were just there because like need something to put on page 60 this week. Like that's <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> They're not all gold. Uh, Things it, Shonen Jump doesn't want you to know. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> no, we totally thought that that series that we canceled in 12 chapters was going to do really well. Yeah. Or it's like, you know, we threw in uh, X Naruto one shot 25 because like it, it's the story of random character you didn't care about because uh, Oda's sick this week. Right. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, overall, I'd say like, yeah, I, I'm. I was glad to have read this. Uh, I didn't need all of it. It's not. It's just not something that I'm drawn to. Um, I would liken this to reading like a historical textbook where yeah. it's like, there's some information that I should have um, as someone who is, you know, intellectually curious. I want to get that information. But then like at the end of it, I'm sitting there going, well, that 200 page textbook that I read that I just read had 20 pages of content that I actually am going to retain. <laughs> I, I was thinking as I was reading this um, and I was thinking about how, like, what are we going to talk about on the podcast? I was like, you know, this is in many ways the reverse of what heroin addiction is supposed to be. <laughs> heroin addiction is supposed to be you explaining this new fung newfangled manga manhwa to me <laughs> and all the tropes and stuff. I don't know. I was thinking about this. I was like, Brad's going to read this and he's going to think this is old and terrible. <laughs> I don't think it's terrible. No, I know you don't. It's but. obviously old. Um, and again, I think it's like, if you are someone who is curious about how we got to where we are with Manwa and, uh, you know, romance and drama manga as well, like this is, this is a good place to look at and be like, there's, there's a lot of stuff here, the way that things are dramatic and over the top and everything that, you know, we've likened to soap operas in other series many times, but like, this is it. This is, this is the, the origin and not necessarily origin, but like, this is one of the precursors to where we're at today. Yeah. Well, do you want a rubric? Cause like, I mean, we can, we can, if you um, want, it's up to you. But as we have established, I am missing a lot of this. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I guess we can just go with like the real important thing here is like, should you read it? And I think, yeah, I mean, I've heard this said a lot about like weird experimental music is like it's your favorite band's favorite band. <laughs> like, like there's people that like make make art for artists. And I don't think that's what this is, but at this point, it might be what it's become. I think if if someone has listened to everything that we've said so far, they've got to this point. I think that they can come to their own conclusion if they want to read this or not, because this is not something that everybody's going to want to read. No, it's not even necessarily something that everybody should read. But if you are someone who is really into the genre, if you're curious about how things went, or if you're just super into over the top dramatic vampires, (laughs) <laughs> well, and I'll, I'll, I'll add a couple of things. Like, I think if you're really into shoujo manga, like you said, if I was to put together a a college course teaching shoujo manga, this would be on the syllabus. Yeah. Uh, I do think it is very important. I wouldn't let... I know the, the shonen eye, the boy love stuff that can scare some people away because a lot of that stuff has become kind of like fetishy and, and porny. Um, not all of it, but some, most of it is still fetishy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to say that this isn't objectifying, um, homosexual male relationships a little bit, because obviously this is, drawn for women to watch not (laughs) it's not actually probably written for gay men i think it's written for uh like a voyeuristic female perspective but i don't mean that there gay people didn't exist in japan in the 1970s (laughs) so it's fine (laughs) um but yeah i think it's 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 a little objectifying but um it's not, it, it, I think it's first and foremost, like a romance. I don't, I think these, these are characters who are like well-rounded and it's not, there's a lot of like fluidity to some of it. Like Edgar is, there's a, there's a scene where Edgar is uh, performing in a Shakespeare play and the boys in the audience are commenting that they don't know if he's, if that's supposed to be a, a man or a woman. <laughs> And they're like, that's the best part. Uh, that's why he's so good at it. And uh, there are, there's, in the Shakespeare play, of course, Edgar is supposed to kiss a boy dressed as a girl. And there's, there's some gender play. There's, there's a lot of fluidity. Like, Alan doesn't care who he kisses. Yeah, right. As long as it's pissing off Edgar somehow. <laughs> um, so I, I think there's a lot of that interesting early... Um, I would say queerness. I don't, yeah. if you can consider like I said, I don't know, is this written for straight women to look at and, and to think it's hot? I, I don't think so really. I think there's something more to it of like, there's, there's like Edgar is very non-binary. He's not masculine by any stretch of the imagination. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of androgynous romance and, and uh affection and intimacy and nothing too explicit nothing it doesn't ever cross the line the violence isn't that violent the the it's s- funny because on on this site <laughs> uh it says uh, it's got the gore tag on it and i'm like uh i don't know about that guy <laughs> there's yeah i i wouldn't say it's gory at all I don't think it's gory. I don't think it's perverted. It might be I, gory for 1970. Yeah. I, I think it's, um, I would say this is like maybe, uh, a, a, an older teen kind of book, but only because I think a younger teen would find it boring. Yeah. And also probably not understand a lot of what's going on. Yeah. I do think you have to take it for what it is and for the time it was written and you have to be willing to maybe, approach it like an old Victorian novel that like some things might be alien to you. Uh, But yeah, overall I think this is like the translation is amazing. If you read the official translation, 
Uh, I will say, I, I don't think the translation that I read was bad, uh, but there were definitely some parts where I was like, I don't think that's probably what they were going for when they wrote that. Um, so once again, you're going to want to go with the official, um, especially because if, if you do want to get into this, you're going to want to read all of it and you're not going to be able to, unless you get the official version. So I'm, I spent, like I said, I don't know, maybe the version I've got is two hardcover volumes. One of them is like 600 pages. The other is like 400 pages. Um, they're 40 bucks each. It'll set you back a bit. Maybe you can find it in the library. Yeah, maybe you could find it in the library. We've, maybe we have a couple people going on library journeys <laughs> yeah, <laughs> recently, I, so you could probably put it on the list. Um, there, maybe they'll come out with a a paperback um, that's a little cheaper. The one I was looking at, uh, I think I was looking at the same one you were because it's the the two. Uh, it's like the a, complete Poe clan, uh, $80, which is the two. Um, but you can get them one at a time for yeah. 40, which, um, so I didn't see anything on here about paperbacks. I think it's worth it. I think, uh, if oh, wait, you're the, wait, oh. you got, did you get the, the box set? No, I got them individually. One oh, time. interesting. The box set actually doesn't come out until November 12th. This was fairly recent. This was really tough to get in English for a long time. So I'd say support it if you're interested in this kind of thing and maybe interested in having them bring over other old manga, particularly shown shoujo manga, because they don't do that a lot. Like Tezuka is having a moment and, <laughs> uh, you know, Chunji Ito and Kazuo Umez, uh, but that's all like the gritty, gross horror stuff that mo- anime and manga kind of got famous for in the eighties and nineties. The shojo stuff has been kind of neglected. So I'd say support it if you can. Um, hey, if you get your library to buy it, then somebody still bought it. So <laughs> that's supporting it. Um, yeah, I'd recommend it, but yeah, with that caveat that you got to be a little, little in the weeds. So, yeah, I mean, we can we can rubric it um, with the caveat, the heavy caveat that I have not read the whole thing and I am missing a significant portion of what would be the romance aspects of it. <laughs> It, it's definitely more of a tragedy than a romance. Do you want to include romance on here then or not? Mm. Yeah, I think we have to. Yeah, let's go ahead and include it because this is the, this is the foundation of the shonen eye genre. So there should be some eye. <laughs> well, as always, we will then start off with content and ideas. I'm going to give, I'm going to give a five. <laughs> I, I was looking at a five. Uh, exceptionally original or interesting ideas are thoroughly developed in a way that has a lasting impact. Given that this looks to be the origin of so many of these ideas, I I do think five is probably pretty reasonable. Yeah. I mean, I I could dig deep into vampire stuff and probably find where she's getting some of this, but she, uh, she definitely knew what was going to pop. I can tell you that. (laughs) Um, that said, I think I'm going to go with a four. Okay. Now that's fine. Again, I read these in different orders Um, I didn't get everything, so I, it could very well be that that is what the difference here is, is that I just didn't get a full enough picture. Um, but I do want to give it points for being original (laughs) if this is the actual origin, because there's a lot of things in here that are like, oh, I've seen this in modern things, 
um, just over and over again. You can get two these. gay vampires raising a girl child in before interview with the vampire. I'm just like, come on, <laughs> that this is ridiculous. Anne Rice, do you speak Japanese? <laughs> That's a good point, though, considering how many <laughs> things are in here that will then show up in later media. Um, because this, I can't imagine this was translated into English. No, I think it's just two people converging on the same same idea. But I, I think at the very least, that means like Moto Hagio is, is plugged into the moment. I would say I like this as much as any Anne Rice novel. <laughs> Um, for what that's worth, I think she's as good a writer as Anne Rice. I, I yeah, huh? I'll stick to that. <laughs> All right. Uh, pacing and structure. Um, I'm looking at this from a standpoint of each chapter being its to, own yeah. thing, which I think is fair. Um, there's, there are pieces of some chapters where you need knowledge of other things to sort of understand what's going on. But besides that, each chapter does pretty much stand on its own. Um, as I mentioned before, the order in which I read it did work out really well um, because each of the chapters felt like its own standalone vignette. And the only information I needed, I did get from the first chapter that I read. Um, so for that reason, I'm going to say each, each of these individual chapters was paced as close to perfectly as I think you could get. I, I really think that, you know, it, there's a huge range of page count in these chapters as well, because some of them, like the first one I read, 120 some odd pages um, a bunch of them were only like 15. Some of them might even be less than that. And then there were a couple that were like in the 30s. And each one of them felt self-contained and also like things felt ordered and proper. And there weren't really any points where I was like, oh my God, we just went straight into this. Like no buildup or anything. It, like everything felt natural. So yeah. I'm going to give it a five. It's, it's punchy. I, I think I'm reading it in the order it was published in the way it was published. Now I don't know, like sometimes manga artists go back and they touch up stuff for the graphic novel release. I don't know if that's what happened here, but like, I think it's extremely well written. Like I, this is the kind of thing I could cover on words about books and just talk about the writing. So I, yeah, I was going with a five for pacing and, and the, stru would, the structure's would... weird. That's the only thing I'll say. It's weird <laughs> to bounce around in time. It's weird to have wildly different size chapters and stories. I think what was happening though, with these wildly different size chapters and stories is month to month, the bigger chapters actually did come out in 19 page batches, mm -hmm. but then they were grouped. They were, it was like, you know, chapter six, a chapter six, B. like <laughs> this, the one here, uh, chapter nine for what I read has eight parts. Yeah. 9.1, 9.2. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's how it came out. You, you definitely, I want to give it a five for pacing and structure. I am going to give it a five for pacing and structure, <laughs> but I do think you need maybe a little bit of hand holding to understand what's going on here all these years later. And it's like, like we said, like it's really tough to how, if I, if I was going to put together a volume or a collection, like, should I give you a best of, should I give you everything in chronological order? Should I give you everything in publication order? It's, it's a, it's, I, I like it the way I read it in publication order in its entirety, but I will acknowledge like there are legitimate uh, preferences to the contrary. If, if you would prefer to have it another way. Yeah. Um, 
before we move on, I would like you to force Nate to read this. That would be entertaining. <laughs> I don't know. I am, it, it is funny. I, I didn't, I don't think I mentioned this at all, but like I'm a straight guy. I don't read, um, I shouldn't say I don't read gay romance. I didn't used to read gay romance before I got into like podcasting and I decided to like check it out to see what's there. To, to, we, to we don't seek it out for this. It's own yeah, sake. <laughs> but like I, that it wasn't a problem for me at all. I don't know if Nate would enjoy it as much. I don't care if he enjoys it. Oh, well, yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know if I want to hear him whine about it because I uh, quite like fair. it. Yeah. I think it'd be entertaining. Maybe we can make him read it. Uh, so characters. Um, this is an interesting one because I don't really like any of the characters. <laughs> as compelling oh. as a lot of the stories were. Like, I don't really care for Edgar. He's he's too broody and, uh, you know, destroys everything he touches. And I don't like Alan. He's a brat. And, like, I hate how he has basically no connection to anything. And he just wants to... It's not even like he's trying to entertain himself. It's basically just like, did Edgar piss me off recently? I'm just going to try to piss him off then. And that's like his whole characterization. Um, uh, and then an eternal 14 year old. Yeah. <laughs> and then like with Mary Bell, it's like, I feel like she's just too dumb most of the time. And, and this could be, you know, I, I missed, I didn't get some of those stories where she, had a more prominent role, but like in all of the stories I read, she was more just an accessory uh, for, for the men that are around her. Um, and then like most of the other characters, you just didn't get enough of because they're only in one chapter and then they're dead <laughs> because that's what happens to everybody. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean for characters, now, a four is distinct and interesting characters are established and developed. They're definitely distinct. You can go for a three if you, because I think, I think there's I'm going to have to do a three. I'm going with a four, but I think there is, there is some wiggle room for interpretation here because I love it. I love vampire fiction i loved twilight i'll admit it i loved uh i love Anne rice i love uh george R. R. martin has a big gay vampire novel um i don't think he'd say it was gay <laughs> mm. uh but uh no i like this stuff but in terms i guess it all comes down to do you really feel like the characters behave in a way that is consistent with their established motivations uh, or are they just doing random crap to create as much drama as possible? Alan. <laughs> um, so <laughs> it's, I love the drama. I'm here for the drama. I know it is ridiculous. When Edgar got amnesia, I laughed out loud. That was what? How does a vampire get amnesia? Did he get shot in the head? No, he f he was in a carriage. His carriage fell off a mountain, JoJo style, and he got washed mm. down the river. But he doesn't need to breathe, yeah. and he heals from gunshot wounds to the face. <laughs> well, I mean, as we've established with Wolverine, if you get shot in the head, even if you have a really good healing factor, you can forget. You can get amnesia. Yeah, it's a. Uh, I don't know. It was dumb, but well, and then it'll go. So he gets picked up by a doctor, right? But his, 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 you know how the vampires can pretend to have a pulse in this. We didn't really talk about that. No, I didn't know that. Oh yeah. So, uh, there's a bunch of times where the vampires, uh, with great effort and concentration, they can, uh, make their heart beat and pretend to breathe and even appear in mirrors. As long as they're like really focusing on I it. I did know that they could appear in mirrors because in, in that first chapter that I read, they established that because that was one of the things the doctor like looked in a mirror and didn't see them. And he was like, what the heck? And then he looked back and they were there. Um, 
yeah, so Edgar Edgar gets he washes up and he's got amnesia and she even addresses that there's something in the volume where a, a fan writes to her and is like, So if Edgar has amnesia, how is he remembering to make his heart beat? <laughs> like why would that occur to him as something to do? Like he doesn't remember he's a vampire. And she's like, uh, she, she has a big long explanation about how like, well, maybe it was uh, all of Portnell's training or maybe some instinct or maybe the fact that Edgar wants to be a human. Uh, he likes making his heart beat. It just no, feels no, natural. See, his amnesia was so bad that it affected his motor cortex. <laughs> so his motor cortex forgot that he was a vampire. So it started automatically making his heart beat as if it was still yeah, human. No, and her whole thing is, it, yeah, you know, it, I could sum it up as shut up. That's why. Because <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to do the amnesia thing from every soap opera. But yeah, I think that's fair. The, the thing that she invented, apparently. She might have. She invented the soap opera. This isn't her, this isn't her first manga. She, she'd been trucking for a while. All right. Well, now we have to move on to romance. You said we have to do romance, so we're doing I, romance. I'm going to give it... Okay, so I will give it a four, which okay. on the rubric is defined as the romantic relationships are memorable and satisfying. The reader is emotionally invested in the partners coming together. So this is what I would say. I like Edgar and Allen's relationship. I think I am invested in them resolving their little fights. I do feel tension when Alan is like pushing Edgar's buttons and it's like, are you going to go too far this time? Are you guys going to break up? But like it's, I got invested in it. I'm not, like I said, I'm, I'm not a big, uh, BL fan. It's not the type of romance. I, I feel like, or I have this perception that it's not the type of romance I would relate to, but a time and time again, I keep finding myself reading gay romance and finding I relate to it just fine. So I, maybe that's just a dumb perception. Um, it's almost like love is just a human thing and it doesn't really matter what kind yeah, of genitals it's, everybody has. Yeah. As long as like the, I can understand that the character loves this person, I can go along with it just fine. Like I can still put myself into their head. Um, so I think the romance between Edgar and Alan, uh, it is, super melodramatic but it's also like they are these vampires of disparate experience and power and it i don't know it feels kind of like it's definitely over the top <laughs> but in a way that i find very entertaining and i do care about so i'll give it um i i think it's corny and funny that like every guy falls in love with Maribel. Even the, oh, there's so many, I don't know how your translation handled this, but there's, it, it's hilarious how they deal with the Victorian stuff sometimes of how like Maribel's 13 and that's not a problem for these <laughs> dudes who are like in their twenties. And it's like, Oh God, that happened. That happened so much that this is just normal to everybody involved. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think a four. I'm going to go with a four. I'm being generous, I know, but. I'm going to go with a three. Mostly because I feel like a two is too harsh. Um, yeah. Once again, I didn't get everything. So the romances that I saw were not. Um... You got to get. You got to get to the bird's nest. You got to get to the German boys school. Yeah. You want to the, the romances that I got were basically just like, these are plot devices and not the story in and of themselves. Um, so I don't think because I didn't get the full picture, I don't think it's fair to go with a two. Um, but that's sort of where I was leaning based on what I did see of romance. A lot of the Maribel stuff does come in at a two. Yeah. I will tell you that you could definitely tell the author did the Maribel stuff, uh, and, because she thought like, Oh, this, this is what Victorian romances do. And that's what I'm writing. And <laughs> then you can sort of see the evolution of as Hagio realizes she can get away with the BL stuff. 
that's 100% what she cares about. The Maribel stuff is just like, oh, you're so beautiful, Maribel. And I love you because you're beautiful. Yeah, right. Because <laughs> if anybody spent more than like an hour with her, they'd be like, this girl's sort of dumb, isn't she? Yeah, she's, <laughs> she's a little infantilized, yeah. All right. Well, now it's time to talk about the art. So first we've got art competency. Now, as I said before, I'm not really into this style. Mm-hmm. Um, so looking at it from more of a objective standpoint, as far as like the actual execution of what was done, um, I, I think I need to go with a three. Okay. So for, uh, uh, from an objective standpoint, it wasn't bad. It didn't detract from the story, but there were enough places where things didn't line up properly. The art, some of the styles got mixed together, those kind of things that sort of just drug it down. And so a four is the art elevates the story. The artist displays a mastery of their craft. As we've established in other episodes, a four is basically like, are you doing the normal style as well as it can be done? So you're not doing anything new or interesting. I would say this art style probably fits this story really well, but there's not enough of that like technical proficiency in keeping things um, at at the same like level of, of visual um, non clutter, basically. Yeah. There. Um, uh, okay. I'll. There, there were enough times where something happened and I couldn't tell what was actually going on. Mm. And for the most part, it didn't matter, but it was like, like any kind of action or anything like that. I'm just like, I don't, I don't know what they're doing. Okay. But now that person's dead. All right. <laughs> um, I'm going to go with a four with the acknowledgement that there is kind of a consistency issue. Yeah. Um, there's, it's old time manga. It's pre digital art. And I don't think every, every page got the same care and attention as every other page. You, you could definitely see there's some rushing. And I think that's where a lot of mistakes are made. And, uh, I think there is, and th this probably goes under visual effects and, and stylistic flourish. There's a little bit of getting lazy with the screen tones. <laughs> it's something I notice. Uh, and it's look, I've never worked with screen tones and I'll be honest. I never will. Um, I'm never going to cut out from screen tone paper, the tone, and then paste it onto the page. Uh, I understand how tedious and how hard it is to get that right. And I totally understand why you take a shortcut, but there's little things like where the pattern of somebody's jacket is like, there should be some kind of like arc to indicate that this is not all in the same space, but it's just a flat, even plane of like, <laughs> and I've called that out in Manwa before. And I think, I, I think it's, when you do it digitally, it's it's especially bad. But like on paper, I understand there's so much time in the day for this, and you probably had an assistant do it. <laughs> um, um, just a short interjection here that is literally just for Kermit. It was screen tones. That's the word we were looking for. <laughs> okay, the dots, <laughs> the dots and the patterns. <laughs> um, but yeah, I I'm gonna go with a four. I think when I'm letting those things go because of my love for old manga. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think there's something to be said there where we're looking at something that was done before an establishment of like, I, I don't want to say professionalism, but like that kind of like the tools weren't as standardized. Right. For sure. This is how we do these things. Yeah. So, there's a level of forgiveness that you give there. And if this came out today, 
I would probably give this art a two. But because of what it is, when it was drawn. You know, that'd be, that's an interesting thing because uh, this is coming out today. <laughs> we could look I, at I, it and see, yeah. I'd like I don't to know see how it changes. What the, current, yeah. what the current stuff that's coming out is. Now, that said, if it looks exactly the same as this, I don't think that's a problem because it's an established work. Mm-hmm. So if you're matching the style that it already had, that's not a, necessarily a detriment. But like if a new a new artist came out and was like, here's my manga, look at this, and it looked like this, I'd be like, I, unless it was literally like, hey, I'm, I'm doing this style on purpose to have this point, you know? Mm-hmm. If it was, if they were just writing a random story and it looked like this, I'd be like, this ain't it. Yeah. I mean, uh, like I said, I think I'm being generous, but I do agree with you. There is the readability problem. Like I too did not realize that guy had been hit by that carriage until his hat was rolling away. <laughs> so that is pretty, pretty worth taking off a point, but I'm going to use my, my critics bias to elevate my favorite manga. <laughs> it's fine. Um, I am going to give visual effects and stylistic flourish a four. Yeah, I went with a four. Like I said, I noticed the screen tone problems, but I do love the effect when Edgar is uh, like going vampire of like he goes white and like the outlines of his face turn into dots. Yeah, I think if if out of anything else in this entire thing, the one thing that she does really well is to apply the dreamlike state of a a vampire visit <laughs> as yes. it were the the way that you know you read through this and you get this picture of just sort of like fog and like still calm quiet and just like little points of light that'll flit in and out and um and then on top of that there's like all the flowery imagery that, mm-hmm. that takes place. I think those kind of things were done really well. And for its time, you can tell that she spent a lot of time with that, that she was going for something with that imagery and the care that she applied there, which fell off in other places, but in, in those places it really hits really well. So so Ben's going to give this a five for personal preference. 100. <laughs> um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it a three. So generally positive towards the comic, not your thing, which I think is hits, hits the mark on this perfectly. Probably where I thought you'd be, too, yeah. <laughs> to be honest. I'm, I'm glad you entertained me with this one. Um, I would, if we gave half points, I would give this a 3.5. The 0.5 comes strictly from the historical context that this gives. Um, I'm not an overly academic person, but this makes my academic side come out and be like, you are looking at a piece of history. This is directly related to things you like right today that are coming out today. And this was an origin point of those. And that, journey that I took in reading this, I think was very important. And I, I, I want to give credit there for what that's doing. Yeah. And I'll be real with you. There's, there's two kinds and this goes into recommendation strength where I think I'm going to say a four and I'm going to apply genre fans to mean uh vampire fans. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a couple different genres here. Yeah that you could apply uh the vampire fans the the drama fans manhwa manga drama uh shoujo jose stuff like there's there's a lot here for a lot of different people um and i think it's i think it's fair to say if you're really into this the current state of of these manhwa and manga this is something you should check out so I'm also going to give it a four for recommendation strength. Cool. Yeah. Cause there's, you know, it's, 
it's like you said with the history aspect of it too. Like this is super influential. Uh, like, I don't know. There's been TV shows, live action TV shows. Um, the Takarazuka review, the all female Japanese musical theater company. They're fairly popular. They have a Poe clan stage musical. Hmm. Um, and I think that honestly, that's probably the perfect way to consume it. If you could get it subtitled, I don't think you can, but I mean, there's no better people <laughs> to convey to 14 year old boys than 20 year old women. It, they are going to look more like the characters as drawn yeah. than anyone No, that else. wasn't, yeah. no, I'm yeah. being serious. Yeah. <laughs> like, cause yeah. a 14 year old boy is not going to be able to play this part. <laughs> no, but I will say with my recommendation, I think if you can get this, uh, Rachel Thorne is the translator of, of these, uh, Fantagraphics editions. If you can get this translation, that's going to enhance your experience quite a bit. Yeah. I, I, I will not. And I haven't, I'm not recommending the scanlation version of this. While my experience was not bad. And I think the order I read the chapters in was good. And I got the information I needed out of it. I do wish I had come into it blind reading the official version. I think it would have been a better experience. So, yeah, I, I really do wish. And you know, like you said, if there was ever like a best of, I really do wish there was some way for people to get this a little cheaper to give it a shot. I don't know if there's a digital edition anywhere where you could buy like one chapter. It, there is not as far as I can tell. Yeah. So uh, that, that kind of sucks. And I guess because of that, even though I'm giving it a four, I can really only recommend it. I think my strongest recommendation is to somebody who really cares about shoujo history and is willing to spend 80 bucks just to have it on their shelf. Actually. So <laughs> there is a digital version. It's on the Fantagraphic site where you can purchase the, the volumes, but it's, it's still just 80 bucks. Oh, so it's uh, the one I'm looking at here. There's seven pages from the first volume mm. or a second volume. And then the first volume, there's nine pages. So, yeah, I, it's a big investment. I think I think it's worth it if you like if you're kind of like into that. I know we have some listeners who are like big into shoujo history and. Um, I, they would probably really enjoy it. Um, and might be worth the money for them, but yeah, I think the library would be the perfect spot. Yeah. See if, if you can that, find it in the library, put it on the request list. Um, see if you can, if you got a cool librarian, tell him sassy gay vampires from the seventies <laughs> sells itself. All right. Well, that'll do it for the rubric. Um, Ben, you ended up with a 89. I know. I wish Nine out of 10. Yeah, that's pretty high. That's one of the highest rated ones we've covered. Look, I'm not here to plug words about books, but believe me when I tell you this Halloween is like tough for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to rate this so high compared to most of what I read. I ended up with what might be a surprising score for some 71. I think it's fair. I like, and, and I knew this was going to be outside your wheelhouse a bit. And I think that's a valuable perspective because I do think that's more in line with how yeah most people are going to see this. Yeah. Now, you know, if, if Ed, Edgar was a reincarnator, then I might have been all about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's he's doing the exact opposite of what you like. He's living forever. I I think there's probably two categories, characters and romance, where if I had been able to read the official version and the whole thing, I probably would have gone up on this. So 
we, you do need to take my score with a grain of salt there. Um, yeah, but I th- yeah. given, you know, seven out of 10, that's, that's not bad for something that I consumed the wrong version of in the wrong order and not all of. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as always, you will be able to find links to the official version in the description. Um, I always do that in case anybody missed that. You can find it (laughs) down there. Um, So, you know, check it out. I think think it's worth checking out. Um, Do you think just volume one is enough? Yeah, for sure. if you get volume one, I think you get you get a you get a bunch of Maribel stories. You get a bunch of uh, I think you get the origin and you get the uh, boys' school. So yeah, that's probably that's probably plenty. For I think you, you really you get like the first and, three years of this yeah. manga. So you can get that for forty dollars, and then you know when you finish that, if you go, oh my god, I need more, then you can get the other one. All right, well, that will do it for the Poe Clan. What a journey. (laughs) Poor everyone around Edgar. (laughs) (laughs) If you ever see a curly hair, curly blonde haired, blue eyed boy. It's probably too late. (laughs) It's probably too late. (laughs) You're doomed. All right, well, now it's time to talk about what we're going to do next time. Now, for this episode, uh, nobody got to vote on it because it's our show. We can do what the hell we want. October but, belongs to me. <laughs> uh, because of that, I decided to do something a little special for next time. So for the next episode, we're going to call it the Recommendation Special. Oh, no. I have four different series, all recommended by various fans of the show. So we will let the fans decide which fans had the best recommendation. Um, I will say most of these are fairly old. Um, I think all but one of them is completed. Maybe all of them were. So... To start off, we've got a recommendation from Last of the Red Rose. Uh, This is a series called Red River. Uh, It's also called Anatolia's Story. I wasn't entirely clear which is the correct version. Um, One of the other titles it says is, The Sky is at the Banks of the Red River. Um, So I think Red River is probably fine. Um, this came out in 1995. Ooh. Um, it's not super long, although I didn't see how long the chapters actually are. Um, assuming what I'm looking at. Oh, okay. Never mind. The version I'm looking at is wrong because it says here it's 28 volumes and 144 chapters. So we might have to find this someplace else, but. Um, again, 1995. So another, an older one. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's Japanese. Yeah. Japanese. Um, so not, not a Korean manhwa, but, um, an older one. Um, next up from Rena for better or for worse. And this one is from, uh, this was one of the newer ones, 2020, but it is complete uh, at 46 chapter. No, that says 115. We're going to have to, <laughs> we're going to have to do a little research with whichever one gets back to find these. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, there, an alternative title for this is Wheel or Woe. W-E-A-L. Don't know what that means, but okay. um, but again, it is complete, um, very highly rated. 
So uh, next uh, recommendation from Moon, Chitra. Uh, Chitra is currently ongoing. Um, this one seems really long. The latest chapter is 175. Um, although it started in 2018, so I guess they're not coming out super often, but um, also highly rated. So, And then last, definitely not least, we have, we got a new contender. Oh boy. We had a comment on the website from Annie, new commenter. Um, she recommended two different series. Um, the one that I picked for this time, uh, because the other one that she recommended, I'm already reading. Um, I didn't have it on our list, but I did put it on there after she recommended it. Um, this one is from 2021, but it is completed with a hundred chapters. Uh, and it is called Survive Romance. Surviving Romance. So, yeah. Uh, also high rated. They're all highly rated. <laughs> um, so, four different choices this time. All recommendations. Uh, we really appreci appreciate the recommendations. Um, you can... You can leave comments on the website. You can join us on Discord. You can message us on uh, X, Twitter, and uh, threads. And what else are we doing? Oh, the, you can just send an email. We got the email address all over the place. So keep throwing them over. Um, as always, you can find that poll up on our Patreon. Um, Every, all of the Patreon tiers get to vote, so make sure to check that out. And uh, yeah, the poll will be up for a week after this episode drops, um, at which point we need to start reading because some of these are long. And also, <laughs> we have to find them. <laughs> well, that'll do it for today. Um, thanks so much for, for listening. Uh, before we go, I want to thank our partner, Segoy Mart. Um, so Gourmet Mart's a retailer of Japanese snacks, drinks, toys, and merch. They got all kinds of stuff you can't get outside of Japan. Uh, our listeners can click the link in the description or use code APR15 at checkout to get 15% off their first order. And as I just mentioned, you can tell us what you think on social media, all those places that I just talked about. Um, check out our website, animepodcasterreincarnation.com. Uh, we have a social links page where you can find links to all of that stuff. Um, as I mentioned, we got the Discord. That's the best place to come and chat with us, uh, but you can hit us up anywhere. Um, and then we also got the Patreon. Uh, besides getting to vote, our supporters also get perks like uh, bonus episodes and getting the high-quality stereo version of the podcast early. Um, and as always, we'd like to hear what perks you'd like. And of course, we got to shout out our patrons. Uh, at our reincarnator tier, we've got Moon and Cake Dwarf. And at our commoner tier, we've got Rena and Kill Hour. So thank you so much to all our patrons. And don't forget to check out the other series on our feed. We actually just dropped a brand new series uh, at the time that this is coming out, two weeks ago. Um, Anime Podcaster Speed Date. We had a lot of fun with that. Our first guest was, was Maxi B., uh, and it was a real good time, and I hope everybody checks that out and enjoys it. And of course, if you can't get enough of Ben talking about things he's been reading, check out his other podcast, Words About Books, where it is currently Ben's Horror Bullshit Month. Yep. Everybody's having fun but me. <laughs> I didn't see what was uh, coming out this week. Uh, I still have to edit it. <laughs> <laughs> You're running out of time. I know. Goosebumps. Welcome to Dead House. Nice. It's actually not bad. It's the second best thing I've read. And if you're not into the horror stuff, uh, talking about Tolkien's still coming out. Yeah. But we're going to get to those Barrow Whites. So, spooky. And then, right after that, it's the, the best. It's your boy. Uh, it's, it's before, during, and after that. 
We got three Tom Bombadils coming up. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Because that's after they leave and then he rescues them again. Yep. Yeah. Well, thanks again for listening. Uh, we hope you had a good time. Now, if you'll excuse me, uh, I got an interview with the FBI about some supposed illicit comics. I don't know what that's about. Not the eye.